All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you uh, just for the opportunity again that we have able to come together and, and uh, glean some things from your word. Lord, I pray that you would be uh, with us today as, as, we, as, we, as we learn what your word has to say. Uh, I pray we'd have open, open, receptive hearts to take in those things and to implement them into our lives so that we can become more like your son, have a closer relationship with you, and just continue to be used by you. Lord, all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, so we see on the screen, it's continuing in, our, in this same study of the resilient life. And today, we're going to be talking about desperate times call for miraculous measures, overcoming personal need. So that's, that's a lot. It's a mouthful. But that's what we're going to be talking about today. And particularly uh, from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, which is on your sheets. So let's start there. Just read, just read it down. And then we'll dive into, into the scripture today. So it says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in, in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. So let's look at this, this, this story that we're probably pretty familiar with, and, and let's see what we can glean from this story, what we can take from this and use in our own lives. First of all, let me say this. You know, most of us today, and in, in fact, probably all of us today, we're going to leave here, uh, and we're going to go have lunch somewhere, or we're going to have lunch at home. Uh, maybe uh, you, you don't want to go home and cook, uh, so you stop somewhere and grab something to eat on the way, and then later on tonight you're going to have dinner. But there are some people that aren't as fortunate, and we know that as well. There's many stories in the Bible, by the way, that, that where we see God supernaturally meet the needs of people. Uh, this lady in particular, whose name we don't know, right, is not given in the text, but we do know her story, and we know that we can take some things from her story to help with us. She lost her husband, she had a huge amount of debt, and she had no way to pay it. So we may be like, we may not be like her in the sense of not knowing where our next meal is coming from, but there are definitely things we can glean from this story. The last time we met, we talked about Elijah, and we saw that Elijah mentored Elisha, uh, and that Elisha wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And we kind of see this going back. I don't think this is on your sheet, but I'll just read through this. 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, verse, uh, verses 9 through 12 says, And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. So we know that at that point, right, Elijah had been taken, and Elisha is the prophet in Israel at, the, at this time during the story that we're talking about today. So with that, let's look at this story and, and, like I said, see what we can get and see what we can use in our own lives from this story. So you, for your first blank, uh, number one here, we're going to look at the desperation of the widow. The desperation of the widow. And letter A, 
her husband was dead. Blank there, letter A, her husband was dead. So this was a newly widowed single mother with a mountain of debt, no money, and creditors coming to collect, right? She's dealing with a very, very difficult situation. Sometimes single parents can feel alone, but this story reminds us that God sees everyone's needs and he wants, to bring the, we want, he wants us to bring those needs to him. Uh, she did what we should all do. She looked to God. Now, we typically, and I say we, I'm including myself in that, we typically have a tendency to, I got to fix it, right? I got to do it myself. That's our kind of knee-jerk reaction when something comes into our lives that we need help with. And I think part of that is it's just our culture, right, in the United States. It's part of who we are. We're going to pull up ourselves by our own bootstraps and make it happen, right? If you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. And this is how we grow up. This is who, part of who we are. So it's difficult for us to change that and, and say, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. God, I need you. Now, as Christians, we, we will eventually get to that point. But what tends to happen is after we've exhausted all of our own measures, then, oh, that's right, there's God. Right, we, we, we've got to get to the point where we, we flip that, right, and change that and take these things to God first. And that's what she did. She went to Elisha. She looked to God. Not only did God provide her, uh, provide for her, but she got a chance to actually participate in the miracle, which is an amazing thing. And that's typically how we see God work, right? He doesn't just poof, make it all happen, but he gave her the opportunity to participate in the miracle. So we know that in this situation, her husband was dead. But letter B, the creditor, had come. Your blank there is creditor. The creditor had come. The creditor intended to take her sons to work off the debt, which was something that they were definitely able to do, right? According to the law, that was, that was a, a legal thing that they could do. Uh, we see that in Leviticus 25. That's on your sheet there, Leviticus 25, 39 through 40. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as a hired servant and as a sojourner. He shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. So this was something that they could do, right? If, if the debt couldn't be paid, then they could take someone to work the debt off. And that's what their creditors were planning to do. She's, so she's facing the possibility of losing absolutely everything. She's lost her husband. She has no money. She has nothing. And then losing her sons on top of that. But this is when God can really have an opportunity to work. Because when everything else is out of the way and we have nothing that we can glory of in ourselves, then that's when God can really step in and do something miraculous. Because then we can't say, look at what I did. Uh, look, look at how I got myself through. All we can say is, there's nothing that I could have done. It was only God that did this. Sometimes God has to bring us to that place in our lives to help us understand that we can't do it without him. But hopefully we can get to that point without have him having to break us all the way down. Right? Seek him first. Seek him first. So the desperation of the widow, right? We've looked at the desperation of, of a widow. Number two, let's talk about the desire of the prophet. The desire of the prophet. And specifically, letter A, he asks her a question. What shall I do for thee? Your blank there, for thee. What shall I do for thee? This is a question that, that, that we should be asking other people in need. It's an interesting question as well. I don't know if he knew all the circumstances surrounded by what was going on with her. But sometimes we see Jesus do that, right? In the, in the New Testament, someone that, that has an obvious infirmity. And Jesus is, comes to them and says, so what do you want me to do? I think mean, that, that teaches us something there as well. But he asks her, what shall I do for thee? 
J James warns us uh, about Christianity that's all talk with no action. So this is what we should be asking right about people that are in need. James uh, chapter 1 verse 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So we look at that term, to, to, to visit the fatherless and widows in affliction. It's not that, you know, I know you have a need, so I'm going to go to your house and just pay you a visit, just kind of chit-chat for a while, and then walk away. I know, you, I know you don't have food, but we'll chit-chat for a while, and then I leave and say, all right, praying for you. Right? That, that's not doing you any good. If you look up this, this word visit, right, in, in Strong's, you'll see that it can also be translated as relieve. Relieve the fatherless and widows. So if I'm going to relieve someone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help them, I'm going to do something to help them. Not just say, hope things are good. This isn't, in your, this isn't on your sheet, but James 2, verses 15 through 17, and you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Because if a brother or sister be naked, so just right, the same James, and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So we don't want to just visit. Right? We, we should want to relieve, we should want to help someone in their afflictions and in their need. This question, what shall I do for thee, reflects uh, the heart of God as well. He's always available. He's always accessible. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. He's always there. We can always rely on him. We can always trust in him. He's always accessible. Hebrews 4 uh, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is one of the things that's amazing, to, that always amazes me, is the God of the universe, the God that has always existed, the God that will always exist, the God that created and made everything that we see and those things that we can't see, wants a personal relationship with us and says, come talk to me. Those burdens that you have, bring, bring them to me. Approach my throne boldly. Ask me what you will. He invites us to do that. That's just, that blows my mind. But I don't think too hard about it to, to be uh, uh, hesitant to do it. Right? So I'm going to do it because he invites me to do it. As I said before, he's always accessible. He's always available. He's always there. Take advantage of that accessibility. The fact that we have access to God Almighty. Take advantage of that. We have a father that is able to fulfill every need that we have. Not necessarily every want, right? Sometimes, you know, Lord, I need a new car. You got that 2021 parked in your garage. <laughs> Do you? Do you? Uh, you might want one. You don't really probably need one. But Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Always there. Always available. Always accessible. So what shall I do for thee? Right? That's, a, that's a good question that he asked and one that we should be asking as well. But also, letter B, he asked, What is in thine house? So thine house... Is your blank there? What is in thine house? This may seem like an odd question. Because here's the thing. No matter what was in her house, it wasn't going to be enough for the debt. If it was, she'd already paid it. Right? So, so why are you asking this question, Elisha? It's, 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 I, I don't have enough. But here's the thing that's interesting when you look at that question. He asked her, what do you have? He didn't ask her, what do you have that's enough? 
if that makes sense. We're going to dive into that a little bit further. God is going to ask us to do something by faith based on the abilities that we have. And this is going to help our faith grow as he adds, adds his power behind those things that we can do. What do you have in the house? What do you have? Not what do you have that's enough because what we have is probably never going to be enough. But what do you have? There are many examples in the Bible we can look at with, thing, with this kind of thought behind it. When God called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, Moses basically said, yeah, I can't do that. I mean, he offered excuses, right, when God told him what he wanted him to do. So basically Moses said, yeah, no, no, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. So then God asked him a question, uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 2. He said, and the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. So God told him to throw the rod down and it became a snake, right? We know this story. And then God told him to pick it back up and it became a rod. Here's an interesting thing, though, that God said about picking it up. He, said, he, said, he specifically said, pick it up by the tail, which is really interesting. And I, I'll say this, I'm, I'm, I'm not a snake enthusiast. <laughs> I don't own snakes. If I did, Jen would put me out of the house, I think. Uh, I'm not a snake handler, right, all those different types of things. But one of the things I do know is if you're going to pick up a snake, you don't pick up a snake by the tail. Because if you do that, that snake's going to whip around and snag on whatever that snake can snag onto. They're going to bite you. If you're going to pick up a snake, you want to pick it up at the head, that way you've got some control. Uh, all that being said, though, disclaimer, don't pick up snakes. <laughs> Just... Or run fast. Yes. Don't, don't pick up snakes. Uh, but but so, so the fact that God said, pick it up by the tail, and he did it, says, man, at a certain point in time, Moses had a trust. He had a faith in what God had for him. So he did pick it back up, and it became a rod again. If you get instruction from God, you should know that he's going, he's going to pave the way for you. He's going to empower you to accomplish the mission that he's given you. He may teach you something from that mission. He may grow you up spiritually through that mission. Right? All these things, maybe individually or all the above, even though it may sound like, that's interesting instruction. But it's coming from God. And we ought to believe him in it. We ought to trust him in it. We ought not rely on our own wisdom when we get instruction from God. Just trust in the instruction that he's given us. That rod that Moses had, it was with him when he went before Pharaoh. Uh, it was with him when he parted the Red Sea. It was held up in prayer during a battle. All those things. It was just a rod. But God used it. Because that was what was in his hand. And right, we can glean so many things from that, right? So, so question for you, what's in your hand? What do you have? All of us has something. Not, what do you have that's enough? What do you have that's going to accomplish the mission? Because when we think about the mission, it's big, right? But what do you have? Because we've got to understand and recognize and remember that nothing is too big for our God. And if he empowers whatever you have, have, he can use that to accomplish whatever he wills. What do you have in your hand? Nothing is too small for him. God wants to use us. He wants to use all of us. And you've heard me say this before. If you're still breathing, God still wants to use you. Are you willing to be used? Or does the task seem too big so you give up even before you start? Like hopefully that's not you. Hopefully you know that we serve a big God that is capable of anything and everything. When Jesus wanted to feed the multitude, he didn't just make food appear. Right? If we look at John chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 5, it says, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he, said, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that, we, that, that these may eat? 
verse 9, there is a lad here which hath, hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And then if you drop down to verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. So everybody was full. And I love the fact that the, that the Bible says this. It's very specific to say that everybody got filled, and there were leftovers. Right? And they started off by, like, this, this lunch and that was it. And God took this, Jesus took this little thing and multiplied it to fill, to fill thousands of people. And there were leftovers. Right? Let's not underestimate what God can do. The woman that gave two mites, we know this story as well. Mark chapter 2, verses 41 through 44. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow had cast more in than all they which have, which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. God is going to ask what we have. Again, nothing is too small. And nothing is too insignificant for God's hands to work with. So let's continue to, to work our way through this. And let's look at, we talked, we talked about the prophet, right? Let's talk about the deliverance of the family. So number three, the deliverance of the family. <clears throat> and then letter A, she presents a pot of oil. Your blank there, letter A, is present. She presents a pot of oil. When asked what she had in the house, she said, all I have is a pot of oil. It seemed insignificant, as, we, as we've been saying. All of us face needs. We're going to have needs from time to time. We always will. Instead of focusing on what we don't have, we should be focusing on what we do have. And that's what this woman did. She focused on what she had. Don't begin to rationalize why you can't give what you have to God. Come up with reasons why you can't give what you have to God. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says, There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Giving is like seed. Like when we scatter it, it multiplies. And that's what God does, right? He multiplies. But if we hoard onto those things, then nothing happens, right? It doesn't do anything. Right? If, I, if, I, if I want to plant tomatoes, if I plant a tomato seed, I'm going to get lots of tomatoes. I'm not going to plant a seed and somehow only one tomato grows. That would be an odd thing. I think plant one. I want twenty tomatoes. I gotta plant twenty seeds. No, if I can plant one tomato seed and get multiple tomatoes. That's what God does. He multiplies. When we just plant the seed, God multiplies. So I have to tell you a, a, a story about something that that happened uh, to us last night. Uh, and I, I put this in my notes. I thought, okay, if I've got time, I'm going to tell it. And I've got time, so I'm going to tell it. So uh, Jen and I went out to, to dinner last night. And uh, uh, this restaurant that we've been talking about going to for years, years. And we keep forgetting, and we keep forgetting, and it comes up, ah, I forgot. So, so last night, I, I, I said to her, uh, what, what are we doing for dinner? And she, she mentioned something that she could, she could put together and she could cook. And I thought, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> but, 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 and then I just decided, you know what? I said, how about we go to, to Cafe Verona, right? This, this restaurant on Independence Square. And, and she said, ah, yeah, let's go. So like I said, I, when I say years, I mean like four or five at least years we've been talking about going. So we get there and we, and we sit down in our seat and waitress comes and she introduces herself and write this, this you know, the, the, the thing, server. 
And so uh, I, I've gotten to the habit of doing something. I've been doing this now for probably probably at least the past two years, Jim, would you say? Where, where I, I, I would put in our order and I said to her, is there anything that I could pray about for you? And she said, she said, well, yeah, I've, I've, I've got, I'm not going to give uh, de uh, heavy details today. I'll just say this. I've, I've, got, the, I've got this ailment um, uh, that I've been dealing with, and, and, and could you pray about that? I will say this. It's, it's life-threatening. And so I, and I, said, we, I said, we will. But because of this particular ailment, I said to her, do you know where you go? And I, I kind of left it at that. But the body language, the facial expression, and she knew exactly what I meant. And she started to cry, and she said no. I said, do you have time? Could you, would you possibly have time to talk with us uh, uh, tonight before, before we leave? And she said yes. So, so we prayed. Uh, prayed of our dinner, prayed for her, prayed for the opportunity. And then, and then uh, we get to the end of our meal and, and she brings us a check and she walked up to, she walked up to, you know, you typically they bring the check and you know, you pay that whenever you have time, no hurry, and they walk away, right? She hand us the check and she did this. Now, now, when I saw that, and Jen and I, we didn't talk about this at the time, but we talked a lot about this afterwards. She it reminded me so much of the scripture that talks about the, the, how the laborers are few and that the, the, the harvest is, is white, right, Un, under harvest. It looked like to me that a seed had been planted somewhere, sometime, and we just happened to be there at this time. So, so I, I was able to, to, to lay out the plan of salvation to her. Um, I, I, I said to her, there's lots of things that I said, but I was able to lay out the plan of salvation to her uh, and, and help her understand that, that, that you know, she's a sinner and she need, needed a, a Christ in her life. She couldn't do it on her own. She couldn't fix it on her own. Help her understand that, that, that her sin and my sin are no different because, because I, I, I have a feeling based upon her ailment that, that past choices have put her in this situation. And as I'm talking to her, she's just, she's just crying. And so I said, at the end of that, I just said, oh, would you be willing to, to accept Christ as your Savior uh, now? And she said, yes. So we prayed. And, and, and she accepted Christ last night at, at, at our table in a restaurant. Uh, just amazing. So, and, and, then I, and then I said to her, I said to her, okay, so, so you, now your eternity is set. Whether, you, whether you're here for another two years or 20 years, your, your eternity is set. But I just talked to her about the fact that she's a spiritual baby, right? And just like a, a, a newborn baby, you need nourishment. You need, you need food so you can grow. So you've got to get into a church. Would you be willing to come to our church? And she said, I've been looking for one. So we gave her information for our church. She wow. said, she said, so remember this is last night. She said, now I, I can't come tomorrow, but the next Sunday for sure. And that's how we left it. Gave her, Jen, Jen, gave her Jen's number and it was just amazing. But, but when, I, when, I looked at, when I looked at that, I thought to myself again, again, a seed had obviously been planted. We just happened to be able to be there for the harvest. Praise God we were there for the harvest. But, but we never know what do you have in your hand that you could do to plant a seed that you might not see harvested, but somewhere down the road, along the way, someplace else, somebody else could harvest that seed. And in eternity, we see what God did because of what you have in your hand, what you have in your house. Don't underestimate what God can do. Paul challenged the church in Corinth about their giving, and, and, and this is in the context of, of actual giving money, but recognize and understand, right, this is not just about money and treasure. But he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 10 through 11, and herein I give my advice. 
For this is expedient for you who have be begun before not, on not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Let me, let me let you know what's going on here. They had said that they were going to give, and it had been a year, and they still hadn't given. So it's verse 11. Now therefore perform the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. <clears throat> so he's addressing the, 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 the fact that they, they're not following through what they said they would do. In the next verse, in verse 12, Paul addresses the whole excuse of, but I don't have much or I don't have enough. In verse 12 he says, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. So what he's saying here is, is you, if there's a willing mind, if you told me you're willing to give, I'm going to, miss, going to assume you have it. Not that you don't. If, if you told me I'm gonna give $50, and it's a year later and you haven't given it, and I approach you and say, why haven't you given it? I'm, and you say, oh, well, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Well, why did you tell me you're gonna give it? Right? This is what Paul is saying here. If, if, if you were approached to serve somewhere in the church and, 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 and you say, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm there to serve. And you never do. And someone comes back to you and say, why didn't you serve? Why didn't you do what you said you would do? Oh, well, I've, I've never had enough time. to. Well, and why did you say you're going to serve in the first place? That's what, this is what Paul is saying here. Right? If you've said you're going to give, then give. If you've said that you're going to serve, then serve. Don't let Satan get in your head and give you excuses as to why you can't all of a sudden. Right? If you've said you're going to do it, trust God to do it and see what God can do through that. Uh, if you're not serving, why not? Honestly, none of us has an excuse because God's got something for all of us to do. And again, he can empower us to do it. If you're not serving, why not? Get in there and serve. So, she presents a pot of oil, but then let her be, she obeys the word. She obeys the word. Elisha told her to borrow vessels, and he specifically said, not a few. Not a few. Get a bunch of them. Uh, Elisha had a big vision of what God could do. And Ephesians 3.20 is one of my most favoritest verses. And it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Right? So like Moses with his rod. Uh, Christ feeding the 5,000 with the boys' lunch. Uh, what, we're, what we've witnessed here in our own church, right, with moving to this new building, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can even ask or think, right? He's an amazing God. This verse can become alive in your life too. There's no reason why it can't. Uh, but God wants you to participate in the miracle. If you never move, then you'll have a stagnant Christian life. Don't sit there because of fear, right? God's given us instruction. Get up and move and be a part of God's mission. Be a part of building his kingdom so that you can see what God can do through you because he can do and wants to do amazing things. These instructions, again, as we've said, didn't make sense. But she exercised faith by following the instructions. Hebrews 11 uh, chap, uh, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So can you imagine being there? She's got a pot of oil. She's borrowed a bunch of other pots. And so she's got a pot of oil, and she's pouring it into an empty pot, and it gets filled. She pours it into another empty pot and it gets filled. And she pours it into another, just again and again and again. And all of a sudden, all these pots are filled, exceeding abundantly above. So she obeys, but then let her see she delivers her sons. She delivers her sons. So after she finished filling the vessels, 
She got the final instructions to sell what she had, pay the debt, and live off the rest. Leftovers, after all that. She ended up with more than enough. Her concern when she first came to Elisha was that the creditors were going to take her sons, and this miracle took care of all of her concerns. All of it. Our faith in God can have generational consequences, right? When we talk about her sons and the effect here. So as our, our, our children and grandchildren hopefully see our faith in action, right? If they grow up seeing us, some trial or something comes into our life, and we go to God, and then God works in our lives, and our kids or grandkids see that, and they grow up with that, and they think, okay, that's something I can do. Hopefully that's what we're showing them. But the opposite happens as well, right? Trial comes to my life and the sky is falling, then our kids see that. And so then they will in turn, when something comes to their lives, then the sky is falling. So hopefully we are, we are mirroring to them and showing them the great God that we serve. So then as they grow up and as they come up, their initial reaction will be, let's pray about this. Let's go to God about this. God has an ability to multiply what we give. We've said that before as well. Luke 6, verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Right, we look at this verse, it's like you've got a vessel, you've got a, you've got, you've got a Tupperware, you've got your good, your good big Tupperware, and you're pouring something in it, right, grain, I don't know what it is, and, and, and you're, you're shaking it, tapping it down, pressing it so you can fit more in, right? That's what this is talking about. But then it even goes beyond that to say running over. Right? This is what God is capable of. This is what he can do. This is what he wants to do in your life. I hope that you want that kind of blessing in your life. But you won't get it if you live a life of faithlessness. Let's not live a life of faithlessness. Sometimes we want to put God in a box. We forget that he's able to do the impossible. And he always is. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretch out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Right? Nothing is impossible with God. There is nothing too hard for him. We say it, do we believe it? Right? How does your life show that you believe it? Hopefully, if your life is showing that you don't believe it, that you can make that change today. I'll tell you this, though. If you decide today that, okay, Lord, my life has not been showing this, I'm changing today. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe in you. Then the trial is coming. Because what God is going to do is he's going to show you if you really believe him or not. So then when the trial comes, trust him. See what he'll do for you. It'll change your life. So when you have need, you can trust God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, 7 through 8. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. You have all sufficiency in all things because you have the Lord. Trust God with your needs. Bring them to Him in prayer. Go to Him first. Don't try to fix it first and then go to Him. Go to Him first. Trust God with what you have. We all have something. We've all got something in, your, in our hands. Trust him with what you have. Nothing is too little. Nothing is too insignificant. In fact, the little things that you have is great for him to work with because then he can show how powerful he is through our littleness. He can multiply whatever you have. As God blesses you and uses you, it will build experiences in you 
and prepare you for the next time and prepare you to help someone else that's in need as well, to help build them up and edify them. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's so rich. It's got so much for our lives. Lord, I thank you for the fact that we can approach your throne boldly, that we can rely in you, that we can trust in you. Lord, help our unbelief. Help us to, to get us to the point to where we do trust you unconditionally. That when we see things in your word that says that nothing is too hard for you and nothing, nothing is impossible with you, that we have lives that live it and lives that show it and lives that reflect it. Lord, if this is an issue that we've, that we've got going on today, I pray that today we would, we would, we would recognize that issue was there and we would uh, say today that this would be a new beginning for us that we would begin to trust you with what we have in our hand, and that you would use that to further your kingdom. Be with us the remainder of the day. Help us to see those people around us that need you in their lives, and, and give us the opportunity and the willingness to open our mouths to speak truth to them. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. And all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.